broadcast tonight, South Korea ups its vigilance against additional provocations by North Korea as it believes more rockets could be fired after a series of short-range launches the day before. Korean doctors and the government narrow their differences ahead of a union strike set to begin on the 24th. A look at compromises that were made. Plus, the results of a critical vote in Crimea is out. Polls show nearly 97 percent of voters supported moving the region's allegiance to Moscow from Kiev. Well, these stories and more next on Arirang News at 8. Good evening to our viewers in Korea and hello to those of you who are watching from around the world. It's Monday, March 17th here in Seoul. I am Yuji Hae. One day after North Korea fired off dozens of short-range missiles into the East Sea, Seoul increased its vigilance in the region, fearing that the communist state would carry out additional provocations. Defense Ministry correspondent Kim Hyun-bin has more on Seoul's response and what analysts say the latest missile test might indicate. South Korea's defense ministry officials say they think North Korea's missile launches on Sunday were in response to ongoing annual military drills between Seoul and Washington. North Korea fired off 25 missiles at three different times on Sunday. We view this as an armed protest against our joint military exercises with the U.S. North Korea needs to stop its provocations. Kim said Monday that the ministry is keeping a close eye on the possibility of future provocations, as the launch pad used for the missile launches is currently on standby. Pyongyang did not give any prior notification of Sunday's launches from the north. East Coast. The rockets, which were shot into the East Sea, are believed to have a range of 70 kilometers. Experts say it's not unusual for North Korea to test fire missiles, but it is unprecedented for the regime to fire off so many in one day. Officials in Seoul believe the rockets were Soviet made surface to surface frogs, which lack precision but are very powerful. The precision is low. But the missiles can carry up to 550 kilograms of explosives. It can also deliver chemical weapons capable of destroying a military core. North Korea has test fired six gun missiles along with 11 rockets from multiple rocket launchers. In the midst of the annual military exercises, which started late last month and will run through mid April, Seoul and Washington say the drills are purely defensive, but Pyongyang routinely condemns them as a rehearsal for invasion. Those latest rocket launches came just two days after Pyongyang threatened to demonstrate its nuclear deterrence. The comments seem to be a firm indication North Korea may be preparing for a fourth nuclear test. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Over in Pyongyang, China's top nuclear envoy, Wu Dawei, has arrived for an official trip. While details about the purpose of his visit or even how long it would last were not disclosed, North Korean media reports that he landed on Monday. The visit by Wu comes amid a recent push to restart the six-party talks aimed at denuclearizing the Korean peninsula. It is Wu's first trip to Pyongyang since the execution of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's once powerful uncle, Tang song taek The Chinese official made two official visits to the north last year. With about a week left until the nuclear security summit in The Hague, where leaders of Korea and Japan are set to attend, all eyes are on whether President Park and Prime Minister Abe will finally sit down for their first ever summit. The Seoul says it is open to the one-on-one, -on -one, but stresses Tokyo should first take sincere steps on historical issues. Choi Yusan has the details. With speculation rife over President Park Geun-hye meeting her Japanese counterpart at next week's nuclear security summit in the Netherlands, Seoul says there's no reason to oppose a sincere and constructive dialogue with Tokyo. Korean presidential spokesperson Min Kyung-uk told reporters Monday, "What's important is whether any talks can bring out a productive outcome, not having talks for talk's sake." The spokesperson said to create an atmosphere for productive discussions, Japan will have to promptly take concrete steps to resolve its colonial era and other historical issues with neighboring nations. On Saturday, President Park welcomed Prime Minister Abe's affirmation the day before that he had no plan to revise a 1993 apology for wartime sexual enslavement by the Japanese military. This after Abe's chief spokesperson last month said a special team will review victims' testimonies gathered for the apology known as the Kono Statement. 
Although it was the first time the Korean leader positively assessed Abe's comment on historic issues, the consensus at the presidential office seems to be that Tokyo would first need to prove its sincerity. The Abe cabinet still intends to review how the Kono apology was made and denies there's evidence women were forced to serve as military prostitutes. There, however, is a greater possibility for a three-way dialogue with Washington in The Hague. Ahead of U.S. President Barack Obama's visits to Seoul and Tokyo next month, Washington has reportedly been pressuring both Seoul and Tokyo to improve their strained ties. The United States wants strong trilateral ties with both its Northeast Asian allies to ensure regional stability and cope with potential security threats from China. Che Yusan, Arirang News. And moving now to the standoff between Korean doctors and the government. The marathon negotiations over the weekend seem to have been fruitful as the two sides have agreed to terms on some of these sticking points. Our Kwon Suai has more on the negotiation results that have been hammered out. A second doctor strike following last week's one-day walkout may have been averted with a tentative agreement reached by the Korean Medical Association and the government. The KMA and the Ministry of Health and Welfare have been in unofficial negotiations since last Friday on the government's plans to reform the medical sector. They reached tentative agreement on a number of issues after marathon talks on Sunday that lasted until midnight and made separate announcements about the talks on Monday. The agreement covers four points. The introduction of a telemedicine system that would enable doctors to diagnose and treat patients using remote monitoring and interactive services. The government's plan to let hospitals set up for-profit subsidiaries, reform of the nation's health insurance system, and shorter work hours for medical residents and interns. The KMA and the government agreed to conduct a six-month trial run of the telemedicine system in order to test its safety and effectiveness. The system was a major issue that sparked the Medical Association's day-long strike last week. They also agreed to gradually shorten the working hours of medical residents and interns who work around 100 hours a week, which is 20 hours more than in the U.S. In addition, the KMA and the government are talking about setting up a committee to tackle other issues such as health insurance reform. Members of the Medical Association will now vote on whether to go ahead with a second six-day strike slated to start on March 24th, but with the recent agreement, there is a high chance the strike will be cancelled. The association plans to make a decision on the matter in the next two or three days. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. A fresh investigation will be launched into the data leak that hit three major credit card companies back in January. The new probe will focus on additional breach that affected 80 percent of the personal information compromised in the first leak. Connie Kim reports. Financial regulators will conduct a second special investigation on the three major credit card companies swept up in Korea's largest ever data leak. This follows confirmation of an additional breach late last week. The officials will look into how a secondary leak at KB Kumin card, NH Nongyap card, and Lotte card was possible. Disciplinary measures already slapped on the firms may be toughened depending on the probe's findings. In response, the Financial Supervisory Service has launched a 24 hour monitoring system to block any further leaks. The financial regulator confirmed last Friday that 83 million out of 104 million pieces of data leaked in January has been passed on to brokers. January's massive breach compromised nearly half of the population's personal information. The top executives of the three companies have resigned and the firms in question were hit with three-month business suspensions in February. There are fears the public's information will be sold on websites like this for as little as 10 cents per sale. Financial authorities say they'll establish new systems so that people reporting illegal data distribution can be rewarded, but the government still has a way to go to convince a skeptical public that it's doing all it can to stop these kinds of leaks. Connie Kim, Arirang News. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, Join Yu Ji He for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Adirang TV.
move aimed at fostering startups as part of the government's three-year economic innovation. Korean construction companies overseas orders are expected to reach 72 billion U.S. dollars this year. They'll be an all-time high, and it comes on the heels of a decision by local construction companies to collaborate in winning projects as a unit rather than butting heads with one another. Arirang's Hwang Ji-hye reports. Business is booming for Korean construction contractors in the foreign market. The nation's overseas construction orders have picked up in the first quarter of this year, taking the nation one step closer to a record high in orders. The International Contractors Association of Korea said Monday that construction contracts overseas this year have already topped 16 billion U.S. dollars. That's a nearly 70 percent spike compared to the first quarter of 2013. The association attributes the jump to a decision by local construction companies to build a consortium and win projects together. Take Teo Engineering and Construction Corporation, for example. It linked up with four other local construction companies, including GS and SK, and won three large-scale projects in Kuwait worth more than $7 billion. Industry sources say that bidding on projects along with other local construction companies has become a trend as a means to avoid cutthroat competition. And with Korea's construction companies expected to win more and more contracts from countries in the Middle East this year, the association forecasts that the nation's overseas construction orders will reach $72 billion by the time the year is up. That would surpass the previous record high of $71 billion posted in 2010. Local construction companies say they plan to employ their team strategy in other foreign markets as well, like Latin America and Africa. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea seems to have performed better on the trade front compared to Japan last year. The Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade said Monday that while Korea logged a record high annual trade surplus of over $44 billion, Japan posted a record trade deficit of over $110 billion last year despite the weakening yen. The institute says the competitiveness of major Korean exports such as semiconductors and auto parts contributed to the record surplus despite the unfavorable exchange rate. A boycott of Japanese products in China sparked by disputes over territory and history also played a role. Korea and China began the 10th round of negotiations on the free trade agreement in Isan, just north of Seoul, this Monday morning. Seoul's trade ministry says during the five-day work and level talks, the two sides will continue to discuss a wide range of issues, including investment, regulations, and the goods and services to be included in the agreement. They're also expected to discuss intellectual property rights, quarantine regulations, and technical barriers to trade. Seoul and Beijing agreed to abolish tariffs on 90% of all goods traded between them in previous negotiations. The Korea's first ever electric vehicle expo is currently underway in the country's southernmost island of Jeju. Na Young-kyung, who was at the event, says Korea is increasingly more keen on replacing vehicles that run on gasoline with ones that run on batteries. They are quiet eco-friendly and cost-efficient. Industry watchers say electric vehicles or EVs are approaching a tipping point. Automakers are producing cars that run entirely on battery power and are now aiming these vehicles squarely at the mass market. The only thing standing before the mass commercialization of EVs is the required infrastructure. Investment into charging infrastructure needs to be made before the market can expand. The government's support for electric and eco-friendly cars will help boost sales. In fact, the Korean government has been and is still pushing to ensure there are more electric cars on the nation's roads. Up until last year, you had to live in one of the 10 cities chosen by the government to receive subsidies for EVs, but that regulation is expected to be lifted soon. The government continues to provide subsidies for those purchasing electric cars like the one I'm driving right now, and including various tax benefits and other incentives. This year, you could get up to $22,000 in subsidies, and that will make electric vehicles a little bit more price affordable and attractive for customers. 
The world's major automakers are speaking with one voice in their push to provide zero-emission solutions around the world. The commercial director of Renault's EV program says Korea's customer dynamic is a plus to its market potential. What is wonderful in Korea it is that the customers don't have a lot of resistances. They are very open to innovation, they are very open to new technologies, and they accept to go very quickly there. So we still think that 10% uh, of the market in 2020 is a realistic target for EV. Electric cars have been around for decades, but automakers have never been as excited about their mass appeal and viability as they are now. With investment pouring into enhancing battery technology, market watchers say competition in the EV market in Korea is just getting started. Na hyun Gyeong, Arirang News, Jeju. To realize its vision for a creative economy, the Korean government is putting its money where its mouth is. Some 60 billion won, roughly 56 million U.S. dollars, will be injected into what's being called a creative economy vitamin project this year. It aims at realizing sustainable growth and cultivating new business sectors by integrating information technology with existing industries, including agriculture, education, and tourism. The Science and ICT Ministry says a total of 23 assignments have been finalized. They include developing a forecasting system to better prepare for natural disasters and upgrading and networking tourist information to better serve foreigners visiting Korea. Moving now to some of the top stories on the global front, from the tense situation unfolding in Crimea to St. Patrick's Day celebrations in London, we go live for Paul Lee at the News Center. Paul, let's start with Crimea and the final results of the controversial referendum. While Crimeans voted overwhelmingly to split from Ukraine and join the Russian Federation, but the U.S. and the European Union are refusing to recognize the results and are instead pushing for greater sanctions on Russia. Our Connie Lee has the details. The final results are in. 96.6 percent of voters in Crimea want to join Russia and split from Ukraine. Moscow said it will accept the result. Crimea's election officials made the announcement Monday morning, but even before the results were final, the preliminary votes released on Sunday had thousands of Crimeans rushing to the streets to celebrate with Russian flags. Fantastic. Of course I support it. It's the correct decision. However, the European Union and the U.S. see the vote was illegal. EU foreign ministers are now set to discuss further sanctions against Russia, such as a visa ban and an asset freeze on Russian officials. The U.S. has rejected the referendum results, with President Barack Obama warning Moscow that Washington is also ready to impose costs over its latest actions in Ukraine. In Crimea, opponents of the Russian Union and those loyal to Ukraine boycotted the referendum and denounced the vote as a power play by Moscow. It's unbelievable. Who could imagine something like this? It's worse than Hitler. This Crimean referendum cannot be true. It should be a referendum for all Ukrainians. It's not a referendum. It's a theatrical performance for Russian people where Russia is legalizing the takeover of these territories. The referendum, which came just two weeks after Russian troops took control of the Crimean Peninsula, offered voters the choice of joining Russia or remaining in Ukraine with greater autonomy. Connie Lee, Arirang News. It certainly is a new beginning for Crimea and its people. And moving now to the ongoing search for the missing Malaysia jetliner. Nepal, what's the latest? Well, authorities say a total of 26 countries are now searching for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, with Australia taking charge Monday of the southern search zone. It's a massive international search on land, at sea, and in the air, while other agencies are analyzing radar and satellite data. The scope of the search area was significantly expanded over the weekend, which now covers over 11 countries in Asia, including Kazakhstan, the southern Indian Ocean. Paul, it seems like there has been a shift in the nature of the investigation. Any news on the possible culprits behind the accident? Well, they're conducting background checks on all 239 people on board, and Malaysian police searched the homes of the plane's two pilots over the weekend. 
A flight simulator was taken away from Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah's residence. It's being searched for any clues that might explain what happened to the jetliner. But investigators said that the two pilots did not ask to fly together. And on a lighter note now, Paul, tell us about the festivities in the city of London. I hear thousands have gathered to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. That's right. London held its 13th St. Patrick's Day parade, sweeping through the city streets on Sunday in a sea of white, green and gold. People of all ages joined in the festivities, which included floats and marching bands from across the UK, showcasing Irish music, dance and culture. Taking in the rare bout of sunshine and good weather, residents and visitors alike were impressed with the turnout. Absolutely amazing. There's a great atmosphere here today. It really, really is superb. So I just can't, can't believe so many people turn out for us anyway, which is really, really good. Similar festivals are taking place around the world to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, which originated in Ireland some 1,500 years ago. Famous landmarks are being lit in bright green from the pyramids of Egypt to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and even Seoul's iconic tower on Mount Namsan. Jie? Well, happy St. Patrick's Day to you, Paul, and thank you for the wrap-up of stories making headlines around the world. We'll see you back with more updates in just about two hours. Get an update on the weather with our Kim Bogyong at the Weather Center. Bogyong, it was a warm spring day here in Seoul, but it started to drizzle outside. That's right, Ji Hye. Seoul and some parts of the West Coast regions are seeing light showers at this hour, so make sure to grab an umbrella on your ways out. Taking a look at the current conditions, the nation is under the influence of a low pressure trough from the West Sea, which is why we're seeing light clouds above. Well, through tomorrow morning, the central regions and Jeju will get to see 5 to 20 millimeters of precipitation, but that will clear up by the afternoon. And after the showers, we are in for another warm spring day with tomorrow's daytime highs peaking from between 15 to 22 degrees. And uh, this higher than the seasonal average temps will continue through Thursday. Looking ahead at Tuesday's readings, Seoul starts off the day at 9 degrees with a high of 15. Meanwhile, Gwangju and Busan reach 19. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Jeju make it to 17 degrees, while Dokdo tops out at 12. Well, that's all the updates for Korea, and here's a look at the international weather. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. I'm Yuji Hain Seoul. I'll be back with more news updates in our primetime news at 10 p.m. Korea time. See you then.